Good morning. Thank you for being here. Blessed are the merciful. Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison till he should pay the debt. <clears throat> when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master, all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This morning, we're discussing the beatitude of being merciful because uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And in this parable, we see uh, forgiveness tied to mercy. At the beginning, there is an amount that is owed by the servant, and we know by the end that this parable is compared to us, or it is applied to us. The master is God and the amount that is owed, while it can be calculated and you can figure out just exactly how much money that is, what you do find is that it is the amount of money that a servant could never make. This isn't an opulent man. This isn't a necessarily a rich individual. It's a servant. It's someone who does not have enough of their own means or does not have a great amount of their own ability or fortitude to stand. Much like we may think of our inability or fortitude to stand perfect in the face of sin and temptation. So the, the debt that is owed is an incredible amount that can never be repaid. We see that it is because of pity that the master of the servant released him and forgave the debt. Not only is the freedom offered to the servant who cannot pay, but just there's, there's no way that this can be handled. And so the debt itself is forgiven. Next you see that the servant finds someone else who has done him wrong, who, is, who has borrowed from him or taken from him, who has in some way brought a debt or borrowed a debt from the original. And he doesn't treat him in the same way that the master has treated him. The master says as much, should you, should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? We should have followed the example. The servant should be forgiving because the master is forgiving. And, and this is applied to us. And this is the same principle Jesus speaks of on, in the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitude. This parable says, should you not have forgiven as I forgave? And the answer, or the, and the parable the Beatitude from Matthew chapter 5 says, should you have had mercy because I had mercy. It says it in different words. It says, blessed are, divinely favored are those who are giving mercy, who are merciful. For they shall receive mercy. It's because God has forgiven that we are to forgive a very easy concept to understand. I think all of you probably got it. Cool. I understand. It's really hard to apply it though. It's not easy to apply it. Why? Because to forgive something means that you had to be wronged in something. Right? 
if you want to have your Achilles healed, that means your Achilles got hurt. That part was no fun, right? That part's no fun. That part you don't forget. If, if you want to forgive someone, they have got to have wronged you. I can walk down here and I can punch Damon in the shoulder. I can do it as hard as I want to. Probably won't break his arm. I can apologize. And when he regains consciousness, he can forgive me. That's just a little wrong. But what happens if you murder? What happens if you create life with someone else? What happens if the wrong that is suffered is of a grievous nature? What if it causes you to lose your job? What if it causes you to lose your home? Oh, that's hard. Oh, it's easy to say, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I, I need to forgive like God forgave. Did somebody burn down your house because they accidentally left the candle burning in the restroom? That's not so easy. All of a sudden, that's not so easy. What if they do something wrong at, at church? Because specifically, this is talking about our brethren. They led the wrong song again. I am almost persuaded not to sing it. See what I did there? Pretty good one. Okay. What if they led the, led the wrong verse? Made the song come to, to a stop? What if they said the wrong thing? Yeah. What if they prayed that ser or said that sermon that you just knew was directed at you? This is specifically about our brethren. It's easy to understand the concept. But there's another part of it. There's a human element of forgiveness. And that is this. It's hard for us to even just accept an eye for an eye. Right? Somebody does something wrong, they need the, they need the death penalty. They need, you know, the, the full, if it's a bad enough thing, they need whatever and then some. Or they need whatever's returned to them and an insult. They need a little bit extra on top. There's a, there's a, got into a vehicle accident. The accident itself was minor in, in nature. The, the vehicle damages were, were not too much. A couple thousand. Guy sues the insurance company for pain and suffering and admits on paper things that I would be uh, ashamed to add, admit to anyone verbally. And, and he writes it down for a court to see. Because so, there's a $10,000 deductible and he could just sue for the deductible. It's not just the damages. Fix the damages. Fix the wrong that is done. It's, man, we want that little extra on top as well. So we get that snide comment in. It's not just that I don't forgive you. I'm going to dig at it a little bit. I'm going to twist it. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to pay attention. I'm not going to participate. I may even leave. We want a little bit extra. That perpetrator has got to get what comes to them. And while it's true that God is a God of justice, He also desires mercy more than justice. We want to have our gotcha moment. And while I brought up pain and suffering, I understand that that is a real factor. And I'm not telling anyone that if you find yourself in certain situations, they're not justifiable means. What I'm pointing out is that it's in our nature to want to get that little extra. The depth of mercy is accepting loss over one's own or of oneself Accepting the loss of one's own without proper restitution by the offender. Meaning, I'm going to let you get away with it. I'm going to let you get away with it. You're going to let me get away with coming down? Rolling you a little bit? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is addressing... The, 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 the church there, the members there, they're taking each other to court. They're suing one another. 
And Paul says, why didn't you just let yourself be defrauded? So what would that look like? Oh, you, you loaned me some money. And I say, well, I'll, I'll get around. I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. And eventually you say, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'm just out the cash. That, that's the financial way to do it. That's, that's directly applicable to our parable that, that we read in the beginning. But what if it's what I said in Bible class? But what if it's what I said to you as we meet or as we leave here? What if you are almost persuaded to sing the song again? <coughs> Letting yourself be defrauded. It's okay. In this instance, in this way, whatever this, this situation may be, it's okay. Take advantage of me. I'll allow myself to be put out for you. You know, just in hearing that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't sound even. That doesn't sound equal. That doesn't sound satisfactory. It's actually very un-American. Yeah, but it's very godlike. It's very Christianly. It's a commandment we're given to do. You did me wrong. And that's okay. We're going to find mercy. I'm, I'm going to have mercy. And we are going to have peace. We are going to have peace. Because I'll allow myself to be put out the thing. How difficult is it to forgive someone? Thing? Actually, it depends on about three things. In my estimation, there may be more, there may be less. You may not see it the way I do. But it depends on about three things. How difficult is it to forgive? First of all, it depends on how bad the offense is. Some offenses are easy to forgive. Come forward and confess about things that we don't even know about. It's, it's easy to forgive the person who comes forward and says, you know, I, I've made failures in my life and I need to be forgiven. We find it quick. It's not that hard. But what if it's something that we don't like at all? What if it's something that's maybe what we would consider gross? What if I caused harm to someone? What if I got arrested for it? What if I'm going to have a record that says I can't do certain things for the rest of my life? That's going to be harder to forgive. There are some offenses that cannot be forgiven. It's impossible. Number two, it depends on the offender. If you walk in, don't say anything to anybody, and walk out, I don't know how easy or hard it is to forgive you. I don't know you. While you are my brother or my sister, I may not know who you are. <coughs> While if we converse with one another, it might be easier to forgive you because we have some kind of camaraderie. Or it might be harder because we don't. So it all depends on the offense. It depends on the offender. And it depends on the forgiver. Some people are naturally predisposed to showing mercy. Some people are naturally gentle. Some people are naturally kind. And some of us have it ingrained in our nature to hold grudges. This is going to be that way till I die because that one thing happened that one time. And that's all it took. I'm not going to like you for forever. I'm going to hold it against you for forever. Why did I say that some offenses are impossible to forgive? Because some of us aren't merciful enough to do it. Because some people have a heart problem that says, I will hold a grudge for forever. And so when you, when you commit that one offense, when you do that one thing that you might not even know was wrong to someone else, they hold it, they bury it, they grow it. And that grudge, instead of it springing forth life from your heart, showing mercy and sharing mercy, springs up hate. It just grows this evil. Well, how do you use such dangerous terms? Because they're the opposite of the terms that God says. If you are merciful, you shall receive mercy. But if you are not merciful, 
You won't receive mercy. The beatitude doesn't say that. You are correct. But the parable does. The parable does. So why are some sins impossible, some wrongs impossible to forgive? Because of our inability to forgive them. In Mark chapter 5, it's in Mark and Luke and I believe in John as well. Mark, uh, maybe not John. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus meets up with two men who are possessed by a demon. Now, I will caution you, in the other two uh, places where it's found, it only talks about one man, and that's because Jesus only speaks with one man. If you were visiting today, you may say, one man got up, uh, that when I went to that church, a man got up and spoke. You would understand that that doesn't mean there was only one man there. It just means that one of them got up and spoke. Jesus meets with two men who are possessed by demons, and they say, the demons say to Jesus, have you come to torment us before our time? And I bring this up because of our Revelation class. In chapter 20, it talks about Satan being bound for a period of time. And the, we talked about part of that binding or that limitation is that the demons are sent to, the demons are limited, and that Satan and his ministers are sent to the abyss to the bottomless pit. And what these demons say is, it's not time for that to happen yet. You haven't died yet. Can you let something else happen? The demons plead with Jesus. So He commands the demons to come out of the men and they are in, put into or they take possession of or however demonic things work, uh, a herd of swine and the swine commit um, swine aside off the side of a cliff. That was pretty decent. <laughs> Jesus says to the man, to the men, what I have done for you was born out of mercy. What Jesus is saying to the men, and, and I'm, I'm broadening this out a little bit extra, what he's saying is. If you need the devil removed from your life, his, his demons, if you need sin taken away from you, that's an act of mercy on his part. That's mercy on the behalf of Jesus Christ. The greatest mercy that has ever been shown is that Jesus canceled our debt of sin. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's because of the mercy of God that we receive salvation in Jesus Christ. Because we've received the mercy of God in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Because we have received mercy, show it. I didn't ask Damon to lead it because it's not specific. It's not perfectly applicable. And, and I forgot. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, will you not tell it today? If the mercy of the Christ, if the mercy of your God to, to forgive that debt of sin, one that is insurmountable that you could never repay with a thousand lifetimes of beautiful, perfect lacking of sin, which is impossible. If you had the capacity to repay him, it's impossible. So because of that, he gives mercy. So why can't we at least show that in return? We may rightly say that not only did Jesus cancel the debt, but, but Jesus actually repaid the debt. And I want to bring you back to our definition again of mercy. 
Mercy is required because we did not properly repay the debt. If Jesus paid the debt for us and we owed the debt, our debt's transferred. If you were a banker, you don't just write it off. You would transfer it. It means that I'm going to allow the cosigner to take responsibility. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. In Christ you were, all, uh, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. And you, who were dead in trespasses, in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. Proper restitution to God has been made by Jesus Christ, not by us. What does that mean? It means you owe Christ. In a way, it means you owe Christ. He's the one that paid for it. So what do you have to pay? Nothing. Why? Because your sins have been forgiven as a gift. What do the kids have to pay on Christmas morning? When they open up their gifts, nothing. It's a gift from the parents. Now, setting aside a man made holiday, what do you have to pay because of Christmas morning, the real one? Nothing. Because it's been given to you by your Father as a gift. <laughs> So have to pay everything. If I'm going to live for Him, then I got to do that. And that means that all of those stripes that He took on His back, all that spit that ran down His head, all the bruises that He received from hands and fists, maybe feet, all the wounds that He incurred, for me, how hard is it to say I'll never have to pay that much? Probably won't. I probably won't. So whatever it would be, it's less. I don't even have to worry about my own salvation. But can I talk about someone else's? Because you're never going to convince somebody that there is a merciful Savior who loves them and went to the grave for them if you're going to hold the most minute of things against them. I serve a Savior. He'll forgive sin, but I still hate you because you did this thing. I still hold it against you that you did that thing. And now I'm almost persuaded I should have asked you to leave that song for invitation. I am merciful. I must be merciful because I serve the most merciful. And it's through His mercy that I have received salvation. There's another discussion that Jesus says that says, if you're going up to the temple to make sacrifice, to, to take a gift to the temple, it's more important before you ever go and do that that you go and fix things with your brethren. That you get it right between yourselves. That you forgive as He forgives. Then, with a clean heart, you can go to your God. Thank you for being here this morning. If there's anything that you need to fix between yourself and your brethren, I encourage you to do that as soon as possible. And then, make it right with your God. 
If the church can help you in any way, we stand ready to do that this morning. We'll be prepared as we stand and sing.